Hello, I'm Llewellyn King. Today we are talking to Dr. W. Ian Lipkin, Director, Center for Infection and Immunity at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. We are at the school on the Hudson River, very near the George Washington Bridge. Uh, Dr. Lipkin has almost hero status, has achieved almost hero status in the MECFS community for his work. He works on many viruses, but he's put a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of genius and talent into the issue of MECFS. Ian, welcome to MECFS. Good to see you, Llewellyn. Very nice to have you with us. Um, are we winning against ME? We're certainly making great headway. There seems to have been a quickening of the pace in the last few years maybe the last three years. I agree. I think if you talk to people three years ago, we were still trying to deal with a lot of misconception about whether or not this was even a, physically, a physical ailment, right? And there was the problem after the collapse of the retrovirus theory. That which, is correct. Which uh, really set people back because they had hoped it was, so much for that. It was quite unfortunate. And I think there's a lesson there that we need to be very careful with how we you know, how we challenge ourselves when we have these hypotheses. This is one of the great dangers in medical research, isn't it? False hope. Uh, if people think that if somebody says, I want a, can a cure for this, not just ME, but across the board, a cure for cancer, or for, uh, and it isn't so, but there's a lot of false hope. Uh, how do you guard against that? Well, I think the first thing is a rigor. You need to you know, you, the way we do things in science is, if we do it correctly, is we pursue what's called the null hypothesis, right? Which means that you try to prove yourself wrong. And then if you find that you can't prove your hypothesis wrong, whatever it is, right, then you're forced to accept the fact that what you'd really like to believe, if, if you want to think of it in religious terms, is it has to be true. So you don't set about trying to prove something is the case, you try to set, you try to disprove it, right? You have uh, been identified in the press as uh, the country's premier virus hunter, and every time there's a major uh, outbreak of a virus anywhere in the world, you seem to be called in. Uh, SARS, MERS, Lujo, Ebola, you've been there. And of course, your work on AIDS was very important. With that background, what has attracted you to ME? You know, it's, uh, I actually started very early with ME. Oh, we didn't know it was ME at the time. When I was a resident in neurology at UC University of California, San Francisco in the 80s, I saw some of the first cases referred by Dan Peterson. Who, yeah, who's out who, in, in, who was Incline the, Village. In Incline Village. And then in the mid to late 90s, I was asked by the Centers for Disease Control to investigate whether or not bornaviruses could be the cause of what was then known as CFS. And then more recently, as you alluded to, the whole Exxon V controversy, which came about, you know, in the late 2000s. So um, I've been interested in sort of on the, on the outskirts, if you will, on the periphery of this field for a very, very long time. And I have tried at various points to get into it in a more substantial way, but the resources weren't there. Now, in part, this changed because, and if you want to think of this as the silver lining, the XMRV hypothesis really made people aware of MECFS, started thinking about it in a more vigorous way. And then there was support that came in from the Hutchins Family Foundation, which enabled us to get started. And then, of course, now, as you know, we have these new centers at the National Institutes of Health. But the money is still quite modest. It is very you know, modest. I've, I've spent a very large part of my professional career in Washington where you know a billion dollars there and a billion dollars there is pretty common and yet the money in small millions seems to me to be the federal funding for this uh, disease seems even today to be very modest I agree with you could we do more with more money yes we could where are the foundations uh, where are the Rockefellers and the Fords and the Gates uh, they well, have often made a big difference in a particular disease. They have, but they tend to have a focus 
based upon the interests of the individuals who are leading those foundations. And if there were someone with MECFS or who had a loved one with MECFS who had substantial resources, I think the picture could change very dramatically. This is what happened with autism. So I began working in autism uh, in the late 1990s as well, and it was also sort of an orphan field. That whole picture has changed dramatically with, with James Simons, right, and the Simons Foundation, and the amount of, uh, of information which we've gleaned over the past 10 years as a result of those investments has been staggering, with implications not only for autism, but for related disorders like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and for neuroscience in general. The same thing could occur an MECFS if there were such an individual. It seems to me as a reporter uh, covering this field that there has been a lack of new names at the top, new medical names. The same players that were there six years ago when I started taking an interest are still the key players. Is there something wrong that we're not getting younger researchers, younger physicians, uh, more excitement about this field of medicine and science. Well, you've, you've alluded to two things, right? One is the scientific aspects and the other is the medical aspects. And I think they're both, both important. It's critical, I think, that you realize that, that there was no funding for any sort of work, really, in MECFS. So the fact that you've got people like, um, you know, like me and others who are now doing this, although we may seem like we've been involved in this in a long time, we're really not. We've had no resources to do anything. And these centers do include new people who, ha who are fresh to the field and have the ability to make contributions. If, in fact, more money had been allocated to support these centers, there was a lot of good science that was left on the table that could have been picked up. There were, you know, applications out of Stanford. There were applications elsewhere. None of that, you know, and hopefully we're going to see that there's going to be an expansion of the program. Clinicians, very, very few, most of the clinicians who are involved in this kind of work are approaching retirement, and some are already retired. Well, that's right, like David and there's Bell. Just, and there's just nobody to fill their shoes. Now, the hope, of course, is that if you can offer real solutions, which is why we've decided to name our center the Center for Solutions for MECFS. If you can come up with ways to prevent disease, diagnose disease, treat disease, then it's going to be much more attractive to physicians. It's not particularly attractive as a field if you're a medical person and every day you're confronted by having to say to somebody, look, I, I feel for you, this is a horrible situation, but I have nothing you know, really effective to offer you at present. We talk about research. How do you do the research at the bench with the microscope? How does it work? I mean, we say research without ever thinking about, do you put on a white coat and go into a room with all sorts of files and gadgets? And <coughs> well, white coat is the easiest piece of equipment to acquire, and that doesn't get you very far. What we try to do is we try to, first of all, break down the individuals with MECFS into different categories. Are there certain sets of symptoms which allow us to say this group of people are different than this group of people or that group of people? It may be something like sudden onset versus gradual onset. It may be bedridden versus non-bedridden. It be, may be male, female. It may be racial. It may be exposures to certain kinds of infections versus other people who don't have exposure to infections. Variations in the symptom complex. Then you try to get samples as best you can. Now, a large portion of the disability associated with MECFS is in the central nervous system. You cannot biopsy the brain, right? I mean, that's not practical and it's not ethical. So what we have to do is look at shadows. So we study blood products, we study feces, we study, in some cases, muscle biopsies. We do whatever we can to be as non-invasive as we can, but to get as much access as we can to whatever we think might shed light on what's going wrong. And then you use state-of-the-art equipment to try to study what is different in people who have MECFS 
people who don't have ME-CFS, and you have to match them properly. So if you look at, for example, the fecal bacterial composition in somebody who's 80 years of age from New York versus somebody who's 20 with ME-CFS from California, you're going to have all sorts of confounds. So you have to match people properly. Similarly, if you have people who have one set of symptoms with ME-CFS and you're comparing them to somebody else who's normal and then you do another set of comparisons and you don't separate the two, you may obscure the differences that may be important. So I think of this the way we used to think of cancer. People declared a war on cancer, really sort of started with Richard Nixon, believe it or not. Now we know, of course, that you know, there not only is lung cancer different than breast cancer, different than prostate cancer, different than leukemia, but there are different types of lung cancer. And if you study them at the genetic level, you can find differences that in turn lead to specific drug therapies. So what we want to do by studying various samples in the laboratory is to find a way to pursue precision medicine for ME-CFS. So you come in, we draw blood, we look at stool, we tell you maybe you need probiotics, maybe you need prebiotics, maybe you're somebody who would benefit from antiviral therapies, maybe there's going to be a metabolic therapy, a neurotransmitter, you know, reuptake inhibitor. There are all sorts of possibilities and it's only as we pursue all this epidemiological research that we're going to figure out what is best for you. Here at the center, how many people are working on ME? Well, we have roughly, any, at any given point in time, we have 55 to 65 people who are working in the center, and we have a wide range of products, projects. I would say, at present, we have 10 people who are working primarily on ME-CFS. And they're funded via, you know, the Hutchins Family Foundation to some extent, and the new funding that we have from the NIH. And what they're focusing on are, are several you know, aspects of the disease. We have people who are characterizing the gut microflora, trying to figure out what is different about the microbiome of people with ME-CFS from people who don't have ME-CFS. Uh, people who have irritable bowel syndrome and people who don't. Uh, we're looking at viruses in blood and in the oropharynx. We're examining the metabolites in the blood as clues to what's going wrong inside of cells in the body. And with uh, my old friend Don, Dan Peterson, we're looking at spinal fluids. So there we can have a closer approximation of what's going wrong in the brain itself to account for brain fog. And then as you put all this together, you look at the immune system, the metabolome, the microbiome, and so forth, you use the same kinds of mathematical models that people use to decide what stocks to buy and sell and when, but instead we're using them for medicine and finding relationships. Then, after you have clues from that sort of work, you can then try to develop animal models which can lead to drugs and vaccines which you can test for their efficacy. And we can then move towards other kinds of you know, really tangible solutions which then have to go into clinical trials. We're trying to find ways in which we can replicate some of the stressors that people feel bring out the worst aspects of the disease, whether it be a mental stress test or orthostatic, by that I mean standing upright quickly, what changes you have in terms of your brain function, your fatigue, exercise, and looking at the rate of recovery and how you recover or don't recover so we have this extraordinary group of clinicians who's, you know, you know many of them, I'm sure, you know, who have been participating in this. So, you know, starting from, you know, California marching, marching over to the East Coast, you know, you've got uh, Jose Montoya and Cindy Bateman and, you know, Dan, uh, Dan Peterson and Sue Levine, and then we have these great basic scientists uh, Oliver Fien at UC Davis, who studies the metabolome, and John Greeley, who does expression analyses. And we're working very closely with old friends of mine at the NIH. They don't want to be called old friends. Long-term friends. Nobody wants to be old. 
like Avinath and Steve Jacobson, who've been working. When you consider the alternative, yeah, exactly. Media, it's better. It's better. Do. So, so you know, all these people who are now also eager to do much of this work together, and and we're eager to engage with anybody who wants to help with this process. Ian, millions of people who you'll never meet here in America and around the world are extremely grateful for your efforts. Well, thank, thank you, you Llewellyn. For being on the broadcast. My pleasure.